In terms of legislation, then, members, can I inform you that the CPR bill and period product bill are provisionally scheduled to have their second stage on the 8th and 9th of November, respectively. And on recap of correspondence, the sponsors um, did not seem to communicate to the committee before a reduction that they would wish to use accelerated passage. Um, so that is unlikely to be an option for the bills. The CPR bill has three simple clauses and it may be able, it may be possible to run a committee stage without any extension for this particular bill. The period product bill is slightly more complex and engages three departments. It, it's a topic obviously that the education committee has worked uh, closely on with, um, with key organizations that have led the campaign and we'll want to um, help be as helpful as possible in that regard. The other relevant committees um, have a very heavy legislative workload at the moment. So if members are content, I will uh, accept the request that the Education Committee lead on the period products bill in collaboration with the Health and Economy uh, Committees, rather than leave it to the Business Committee to decide the allocation of it. Um, are members content with that approach? Content. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, obviously, we'll. Um... Chair, could, yes, could I Pat, comment yeah. just while we're talking on uh, legis legislative issues? In terms of this holiday hunger bill that I'm intending to bring forward, <clears throat> I have been advised that if I want or the committee wants or agrees to accelerated passage, that the bill would have to be presented to the committee before that request was made. I'm, I'm looking at Aving to see if she has any further information on that in, in, in terms of the, the procedural pathway. Aving? Um, Deputy Chair, it's a, so the, the relevant standing order is um, standing order 42. Um, so, and it's about scheduling arrangements. Um, and the, the bit about a pre-introductory contact with the committee, uh, I'm just I'm just finding for you now. So, um, where has it gone? Uh, yep. So, beg your pardon. Yeah, so scheduling arrangements, this is the standing order that describes the time frame for all bills and the um, the gap between the different stages um, that's required. Um, so where it, it, part three of this, uh, so paragraph three of uh, standing order 42 says that where exceptionally a bill other than a budget bill is thought to require accelerated passage, which shall exclude any committee stage, member in charge of the bill shall, before introduction of the bill in the Assembly, explain to the appropriate committee a. the reason or reasons for accelerated passage, b. the consequences of accelerated passage not being granted, and if appropriate, c. any steps he or she has taken to minimise the future use of the accelerated passage, pass, passage procedure. Um, and then, uh, so the member would communicate that to the relevant committee and then um, put a motion down in the bill business office um, before second stage um, to move a motion that the bill should proceed under the accelerated passage procedure. So ultimately the decision is made by the assembly um, on a cross community basis, uh, but there's that initial stage um, that needs to be complied with if, if you want to you know, try to go by that route. Does that help you, Deputy okay, Chair? Yes, it does indeed. Thank you, Evan. Thanks, Pat. Okay, members, uh, that's... Uh, uh, sorry, one other item in terms of chairperson's business, Clark. Um, obviously, the Education Committee was scheduled to meet yesterday to take a briefing from the Department of Economy and the Department of Education on the joint Department of Economy and Department of Education 14 to 19 strategy. Um, Clark, you can keep me right, but my understanding is the Education Committee received notice only on Tuesday that the briefing was cancelled. Um, if 
members are content, I would propose that we write to the economy minister and the education minister to seek an urgent explanation as to why this extremely unusual cancellation occurred, given the importance of the 14 and 19 strategy to empowering our young people to make a, a contribution to the economy and achieve a, a, a high quality of life for themselves. Are members agreed in that regard? Great, Chair. Great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Happy enough, Mark? Yeah, members should have received uh, now an email um, which was received yesterday uh, about that uh, that council about the next steps really in in the committee being briefed concurrently um on okay. the 1419 strategy can you can you can you speak to that clark in terms of what um, that says so I'll, it's not that long i'll just quickly read it um uh, request for oral briefing on 14 to 19 strategy. As you were aware, the Education and Economy Committee's joint oral briefing in relation to the 14 to 19 strategy did not proceed as planned on the 20th of October. The project is currently finalising a strategic framework which will set out the actions that are required to transform the 14 to 19 education and training landscape. The draft documents are currently being considered within the Par Department of Education and the Department for the Economy prior to being submitted to both ministers. Given that this work is cross-cutting in nature, approval and endorsement from the Northern Ireland Executive will be required. Once these approvals are in place, officials would be happy to jointly brief the Education Committee and the Economy Committee. Should the committee wish, a written briefing on the process to date could be provided to the committee in the interim. That's your, um, so that's from the okay. data to me, yeah. Okay. Um, useful. Uh, speak language there did not proceed as planned. <laughs> it was it, it was cancelled. <laughs> um, I, I, the thing that I I could understand members at, and Clark was was well, whether the the framework is complete or not, whether it's been agreed by the executive or not. I didn't understand why that precluded. Uh, an interim briefing, you know, on 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 where we are at and on what progress has been made, um, and certainly not cancellation less than twenty four hours in advance of a statutory committee that then was unable to um, schedule other matters that could have been covered in in that vital um, slot that we had available to us. So just just, just a bit confused, I suppose. Um, and, and I don't understand why, having agreed to an oral briefing, we've now changed to a, a written briefing being available to us. It doesn't, it doesn't really explain the cause for the cancellation, although given the nature of that language, I'm not entirely sure we're ever going to get one. We'll try for one anyway, members, if that's fair enough. We'll, we'll write to the, the, minister, the respective ministers and just ask why, um, what, why the the briefing was cancelled with less than 24 hours notice and why having agreed to an oral briefing we're now being offered a written briefing only is that fair enough yep members content okay content. thank you okay members draft minutes then can i refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting on 13th of october at page six of your meeting packs and seek members' agreements that the minutes are complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Members okay to say agreed, just to make sure that's on record? No, you're not, you're not going to twist our arm, no, you won't. <laughs> agreed. That's fine, we can stay on draft minutes for the, the next hour and a half if you want, Robbie. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> there are no matters arising, members. And agenda item five then is correspondence. Can I refer members to page 14 where we have six items of correspondence and a summary note at page 15. Clark, do you want to speak to the correspondence? Yes, Chair. Um, so item five two on page 17 is correspondence from Community Relations in Schools, um, or CRIS, about its survey of nursery schools and concerns about the impact of the pandemic on them. Um, we did have this in last week's pack um, and we didn't really have time to look at it. And also the deputy chair wasn't um, at, there with us at the time. Um, there are some quite uh, 
concerning findings in the survey that's uh, attached. Um, so members, what uh, views do you have on, on what you'd like to do with this correspondence? Yeah, Clark, so th this is um, a survey of 16 nursery schools in North and West Belfast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that has found that eight, the respondents of which 85% of principals answered that they had concerns about safety in their workplace and over 90% of principals reported um, concern regards working conditions during the pandemic had made them um, concerned about continuing in their in their role. Um, fairly, as you say, serious findings. Um, I know we've been discussing um, outreach and, and visits. Uh, I'm just wondering whether uh, if conditions permit um, some type of uh, engagement, meeting, or, or visit um, to 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 these. To representatives of these 16 uh, nursery schools might be a, a worthwhile use of of any visiting arrangements um at, or at the very least um perhaps a, an informal meeting with the representatives of the 16 nursery schools clark what would how do members feel about that i would be in favor of that chair i think yeah. we should do a visit or informal meeting one or the other okay yeah. Me too, Chair. Um, I think I'm even quoted in the, in the letter there as saying, you know, that often staff in early years do feel undervalued in that. So I think it'd be really important actually to hear from them and to hear their views directly, you know. Okay. Clark, are you okay to correspond with the, the contacts? Yeah. Sure. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Members. Um, okay, item 5.3 on page 21 is a copy of correspondence from the Welsh um the Welsh Parliament's Economy, Trade and Rural Affairs Committee. Um, it's a letter to the Welsh Government Minister for Education and Welsh Language regarding the UK Government's statement um, that it would use the Skills and Post-16 Education Bill to ban essay mills. Um, so this is about um, a legislative consent uh, motion and the Welsh Committee um, is very much in favour of banning essay mills and invites uh, Northern Ireland to get involved as well. Um, but it is more of an issue really for the, the Committee for the Economy as it primarily relates to universities. So if members are content, um, we can forward that over to the Committee for the Economy. Agreed. Thank you. Um, item 54 of page 25 is further correspondence from the Pink Ladies Cancer Support Group in response to correspondence from the Education Authority regarding weed killer at school premises. Um, so the initial response from the Education Authority um, uh, said that, yeah, some some of these um, glyphosate uh, type weed killers are, are used. Um, and and, and the group remains concerned basically regarding any use at all of glyphosate or Roundup, um, given its links to cancer. Um, so members, the, the DERA committee will be looking at um, a departmental strategy about the future use of pesticides. Um, so I think if, if you're agreed, it would be useful to, to forward this correspondence over to, to DERA. Agreed. Yeah, are there any additional actions that members would like to make about this? Um, weed killer is good. It would be useful to see what the DARE committee have to say in response to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, item 55 five on page 26 is correspondence from Verbal uh, seeking a meeting with the committee on its work across Northern Ireland. Um, so, this is a, a group that works with people to help them tell stories and um, it, it, they're based in Derry. Um, I have actually um, phoned them just to see what, what they had in mind. Was it was it an outreach um, uh, type engagement that they had in mind? But I haven't heard back yet. Um, yeah, even my understanding is that Verbal is a really innovative organisation that uses storytelling um, for um, emotional health and wellbeing in pupils in schools, and it um, it, it has a really um, innovative 
ICT framework um, that it developed with a, a company to allow it to engage with teachers and supply information to teachers and um, um, monitor what aspect of their emotional health and wellbeing storytelling curriculum has been uh, used and, and followed and, and on what stage it's at. So I, and I think it's really interesting from an, an emotional health and wellbeing provision point of view, but also for a, a, a rollout of approaches okay. using ICT point of view as well. So I, mm -hmm. I would be, I would support us meeting at least informally as a committee with, with verbal, if, if not formally, if schedules allowed, that, that we may need to revisit forward work program in the next few weeks, given the, the bills that are about to be added to the schedule. But we remember to be content in principle that we try to meet with verbal informally or formally if, if time permits. Yeah, content. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, and members, and similarly then, item 5-6 on page 29 is an invitation from Coralia Nagel Scullyocta to visit an Irish medium school. Um, again, I think they're proposing um, that Derry would be the location for that. So before we got all of our bills news, um, this was something that, you know, I was thinking the committee might do those both together. Um, but what what would you like me to reply to Coralia Nagel Scullyocta at this point? I, th I think in principle, um, I imagine the Education Committee would be delighted to visit an Irish medium school. I, I think we are going to maybe have to have a, a brief additional meeting just to look at that for work programme, even given how tight the scheduling is going to be and maybe seek a, a substantive update with regards to what the guidance is in terms of us um, completing a, a, an external visit as well. Yeah, I mean, provisionally, I'm thinking we should go somewhere on the 1st of December after the um, the integrated education bill stage is finished. Um, so it'll be a matter of members, you know, prioritising their favourite as well. Um, OK, um, item 5-7 then, members, on page 30 is, is a short message regarding segregated education in Northern Ireland. Um, if you're content to note that, um, we can add it into... The responses uh, on the integrated education bill. Um, I'm hoping that members will have received their bill folders by now. Um, so that's all of the all of the submissions together um, about the bill and the, the main bill papers, and that will be updated as we continue through this process. So are members content okay. with, with that action? Yeah. Yep. Members content to note that correspondence. Um, and and then to add any res other further responses we receive on the integrated education bill to the bill folder, and to dispose of the correspondence otherwise as per the summary note at page fifteen. Agreed. Spot on. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Clark. Um, forward work program is available at page thirty two of the meeting pack. Uh, Clark, I can seek the committee's agreement to endorse the forward work program as amended, but I imagine. It will be further amended uh, in the in the near future as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Members content to agree the forward work program for now, and and then to come back. I think we need a, a, a brief additional meeting just to to look at that, or or a, a closed session at the start of of a, a future meeting to get on top of that. Given that the PCR bill, free period products bill, and potentially holiday hunger bill, um, if it if it doesn't go accelerated passage, um, could be added to the agenda. Otherwise, content to agree for the work program. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Agenda item seven then, members, is our oral briefing from the integrated alumni on the integrated education bill. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to integrated alumni's response to the committee call for evidence on the integrated education bill at page 39 and give a very warm welcome to Michael Lynch, chair of the board of trustees, Lise McCaffrey, board trustee, Adam McGibbon, member of the integrated alumni. You're all very welcome this morning, folks. Um, can I advise you that the committee will give you up to 10 minutes, you don't need to use the 10 minutes, but up to 10 minutes to make an opening statement and then followed by a short time for questions from members. Thanks very much for your time this morning. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.
Committee, many thanks for the opportunity to bring the lived experiences of those who've been through inter-education to be part of this consultation. The Integrated Alumni is a registered charity started by past pupils of integrated schools in Northern Ireland who advocate for further integrated education. We will share with you today three accounts in the form of a timeline, starting with my own having attended integrated schools in the 80s and 90s. Then I'll hand over to Adam, who attended in the 90s and noughties, and finally, Michael, who left integrated education in 2014. I count myself incredibly lucky to have started my compulsory schooling on day one of the brand new Hazelwood Integrated Primary School in 1985. Even if it was in a disused co-op building in Belfast and only recently cleaned of the pigeon droppings. My parents were founder parents of Hazelwood Primary and Secondary Schools. My father is from a Protestant tradition and my mother is a practicing Catholic and active participant within the church. A photo was recently shared with me of that first AMP one that I hadn't seen before, and it made me realise that the friends I have today from both traditions, some living in Northern Ireland and others in Scotland and England, were with me on that first day. Of course, as young children in primary school, we didn't know there were any differences between our school and others. It was a warm, supportive environment with pioneering teachers and parents learning what it meant to be integrated and to celebrate differences to bring a lasting peace and reconciliation. During that era, all pupils did the 11 plus as a class. I got a one, the highest grade at the time, and had an interview at Belfast Royal Academy where my father had previously taught. But my decision and that of my parents was that I wanted to remain in an integrated setting with all the benefits that we saw that went along with that. At secondary school as a teenager, starting to build my own self-identity, I became more aware that integrated education was different and it wasn't the norm. We were young people of all faiths and none, growing up in North Belfast towards the end of the Troubles. And there were some really challenging periods of violence and division all around us. There was a wide range of socioeconomic backgrounds and, of course, some of the division and difficulties sometimes encroached into our community. But I can think of several instances of sectarianism, um, for example, paramilitary graffiti on walls or desks that were dealt with by the pupils in the class. That is to say, living, breathing, conflict resolution, and then reporting on the resolution to the school senior leadership team. But it was only when I got to university in Glasgow, having left Hazelwood in 1999, just as power sharing was coming into Northern Ireland, that I realised just how different the school experience was for the many other Northern Irish former pupils now at university with me. Some had never socialised or they believe even met young people of different traditions. The learning that they then had to undertake at university or in the world of work, we had simply done by being educated together. I was so struck by this difference um, arriving at university that I wrote to the then Minister for Education, Martin McGuinness, sharing with him my experience of integrated education. He wrote back saying he was supportive of growing the number of integrated and Irish language skills to provide choice. But that was 22 years ago and still to this day, only 7.5% of children and young people in Northern Ireland attend integrated schools. So this bill provides an opportunity to enact the promises and commitments of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement and to build a lasting peace and reconciliation for future generations. I'll hand over now to Adam. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam McGibbon. I attended Lagan College from 1999 to 2006. As soon as I was born, my parents wanted me to go to Lagan College because for them, it was part of their hope that their children would live in a more peaceful and reconciled Northern Ireland than the one that they'd grown up in. In East Belfast at the time, there was no integrated primary school option available. So I attended a maintained primary school and then went to Lagan for secondary education. So that means I've got some experience of more than one educational sector in Northern Ireland. Because Lagan was the first integrated school, it really seemed like important people that were visiting the school all the time. For example, I remember the president of East Timor coming to visit. And of course, as a child, I didn't even know where East Timor was at the time. I remember us meeting secretaries of state, education ministers. I remember David Cameron arriving on his first ever visit to Northern Ireland when he'd just been made leader of the opposition. 
And at the time I was drafted into the choir to sing for him, despite not having a single musical note in my head. So all these experiences of meeting politicians for me means to be a little bit challenging to the committee in a friendly way. Since I was uh, aged 11, I've heard lots and lots of warm words from politicians over the years about supporting integrated education, but unfortunately there's been very little action. I had an amazing time at Ligon. I remember there being a great emphasis on about tackling sectarianism, about respect, about conflict resolution. My best friend at Ligon was a Protestant, so from the opposite community to me. He lived in a majority unionist area. I know that we wouldn't have met otherwise, and we lost nothing of our own identities through being friends or attending Ligon, but we gained so much more because of it. And I've kept a lot of those lifelong friendships from school, from people of all backgrounds. But a little bit like Lisa, it really took me to leave education and to meet people who had very different educational experiences to truly see the value of it. I went to Queen's after I left Lagan and I was really shocked by people who said that they hadn't met a Protestant or a Catholic to their knowledge until they'd come into the workplace or until university or college. I want to live in a society where that friendly contact between both communities happens far, far earlier in life and where that is the norm. As a society, we'd all benefit hugely from more integrated education. And as the committee is no doubt aware, there's a substantial amount of academic evidence about the positive impact of integrated education. A review that the University of Ulster carried out a couple of years ago into 13 years of policy and research showed significant evidence that integrated education has got a positive social influence by fostering cross-community friendships, reducing prejudicial attitudes, creating more positive attitudes on issues such as politics, religion, identity, mixed marriages. And all of this without any loss of community or social individuality. So I want everyone to have the choice of having an integrated education. And that's exactly what this bill is about. It's about choice. It's not about saying this has to be the only way we educate our children. It's about the massive, massive demand for integrated education that currently isn't being met. As the committee probably knows, according to the latest Lucid Talk poll, 71% of people in Northern Ireland believe integrated education should be the norm. And 73% of people here would support their child's school becoming integrated. So this is your opportunity to meet that demand and to take that real step towards reconciliation. That's why we need this bill to provide that choice. So thank you and I'll hand over to Michael. Thanks, Adam. And let me just begin my remarks by reiterating that statistic that you've alluded to, that 71% of people in Northern Ireland believe that integrated education should be the norm. My experience echoes that of Adam and Lisa. I attended Lagan College from 2007 through to 2014. I attended a maintained primary school in Belfast. And one of my most striking memories was that very first day in year eight and being welcomed into the assembly hall by the college chaplains. And it was sitting beside someone in a, a new school, a new school environment. And that person came from an area of Belfast I didn't know of or didn't hear of before. Um, they went to a primary school that I knew was different. And I had that sense that that person probably had a very different upbringing. But realizing an actual fact that we're very much the same, nervously starting a, a new school journey. My school spoke of being one school community where we develop, grow and learn together. In year eight, every student learned the Irish language. And interestingly, those that continued post year eight um, often didn't come from that traditional nationalist background. I recall the yearly Cayley that was held every March, hosted by parents, teachers and students collectively, that real school spirit. And I also remember observing that two minute silence on Remembrance Day and attending those Remembrance Day, um, those Remembrance Day assemblies. But most importantly, discussing and actively discussing the context of why we did that. In 2014, we officially opened our new school building, of which I spent the year in. I recall through the bill that every meticulous detail went into the planning of the school, right from the colour scheme in the classrooms and on the corridors. And by colour scheme, I mean the 
red, white and blues, green, white and golds, and where they were in the school, right through to the goalposts that were used on the pitch, meaning all sports could be practiced, including Gaelic sports and rugby. In the same way that areas of the curriculum were taught with purpose, intention and planning, and that allowed us, those that you're hearing from today, and every other young person in integrated education, to get the best value from their time in school. Parents should have the choice to send their child to an integrated school, and that's what this bill is trying to achieve. There is an unmet demand for integrated schools, and despite the 1989 education order, which mandated the department to both encourage and facilitate the provision of integrated education, despite further commitments that were again brought forward in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, and then further commitments once again in New Decade, New Approach last year. Unfortunately, progress has still been stagnant. I am immensely proud of the representatives of the Integrated Alumni. They're formed from every integrated secondary school in Northern Ireland, and they're part of this organization as they see the value, the uniqueness, and the privilege they had to attend an integrated school. Today, you've met just three of us in Adam, Lisa and myself, but behind us are a group of passionate ambassadors and campaigners. To have a group of young advocates who speak so proudly of their experience, continually through their professional careers, committing time and effort is testament to the value of their schooling experience. It's also worth noting that we've seen a real increase in the volume of those now in our organisation that don't come from an integrated background. 20% of our charity board did not go to integrated schools and we have seen an increasing interest from parents to become involved in the work that we do. Fundamentally, we believe that every parent, but more importantly, every young person should have the opportunity to attend an integrated school. That will conclude our opening statement, so I'll pass back to you, committee chair. Thanks, Michael, and thanks, Adam and, and Lise powerful witness statements for the Education Committee today and, and sincerely appreciated. Um, given our short time, I'm going to move promptly to members' questions, um, but also uh, to, to accept that challenge, Adam, in relation to make, making sure that warm words are, are followed up by action. Um, the, the, the committee has, has engaged substantively on the committee stage of this integrated education bill that I will Briefly say, I am very proud that uh, at St. Alliance Party MLA, Kelly Armstrong, that has, has brought forward and then stepped rapidly back into my impartiality as chairperson of the Education Committee to ask Deputy Chairperson Pat Shane to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks to Adam, Lisa and Michael for coming in this morning. And... I mean, the conversation this morning is in the context of the Integrated Education Bill uh, and, and no one could dispute the intentions behind the bill. Uh, and, and I, for one, am supportive of, of integrated education. However, uh, saying that doesn't mean that this bill is perfect. And when it comes to legis legislation, we need to be absolutely clear and the legislation needs to be absolutely clear and unambiguous because it's one thing the proposer of the bill having an intention to bring something about uh, but that has to be absolutely reflected in the legislation and adam you talked about you know uh, the desire for everyone to have a choice to attend an integrated uh, school and, and and i support that one of the difficulties within this bill is that it would give an elevated position to the integrated sector. Uh, currently, the, the, the minister has a statutory obligation to encourage and facilitate integrated education. And there's the same statutory obligation in regard to Irish medium education. Um, but this bill would actually add and strengthen that statutory obligation in regard to integrated uh, in, in regard to the integrated sector because there would also be a statutory obligation to promote which absolutely strengthens and every other sector would say that that duty would disadvantage their sector uh, and, and and this is one of the issues that I want to tease out with you and and, and where you stand 
in terms of the integrated education being given that advantage uh, over and above other sectors. And bear in mind, it would have financial and legal implications. It would have implications around area planning and so on. So I, I would invite you to, to uh, come in on that point. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, hugely important question. I think um, I'll make a couple of uh, open remarks on that, then pass to my colleagues. I think for us, um, this is about facilitating choice, and that's that's what it comes down to, really. Um, the, uh, the situation at the minute is if you live in an area where there is no integrated provision, the attitude of the Department for Education is essentially if you come to them and say, I would like an integrated option for my child, the attitude of the department is, okay, well, go out there and do it yourself. Gauge the demand yourself. Gather other people who agree with you yourself. Put in an application yourself. So I think um, the reason why this bill is important to us is because we're not on a level playing field. And what we need to do is, is level the playing field so there is a situation where there is that promotion, that proper facilitation. At the moment, there's no managing authority for integrated education. A lot of this is being done by an underfunded charity. It's incredible to think, really, that we've got to 75.5% of kids in an integrated setting just off the back of parents and grassroots activists. So if the department can promote it, we think that puts that on a level playing field with the comparatively much better resourced, controlled and maintained sectors. So that's why we think that promotion element is important because you get to that point where you're elevating integrated education to the point where it can compete with other sectors on a level playing field. Um, anybody else want to come in on that? Yeah, I, I'm happy to, Adam. And just to piggyback on the back of your sentiments, as I made reference to in my opening remarks, from 1989 in the education order, the department has had a mandate to both encourage and facilitate the provision of integrated education. And I can see very little evidence that that's taken place. So here in adding the word promote, we are trying to elevate the, the, the need and the desire for the department to take definitive action to help that provision increase. Um, because to date, the department has not established any form of integrated school. And as Adam makes reference to, that's all been done from grassroots activism and underfunded charity. There's no managing authority for integrated education. So therefore, we need to have stipulations in place that allow us, as Adam references, to come on to that equal playing field. Okay. Right. 30 seconds, Pat. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All of you, all of you mentioned the fact that you came into contact with people who had never met anyone from the opposite community or the other community, uh, and that isn't the case where I'm concerned. I, I grew up in a unionist community uh, until I was 15. All the friends I had in the area I lived came from a unionist, stroke Protestant background although I did attend a Catholic school. Uh, and there was never any issues until the conflict broke out. And then when I was 15, uh, people came to my door to try and kill me. And, and we had to leave our house as a result of that incident. Now, um, in instinctively, I agree that all, all our kids should be educated together, uh, that, you know, uh, you know, if you think about it, why should kids be segregated in, in, in school? There doesn't appear to be a reason, but that's the system we have. And actually, there was a reason why education was segregated, because when the state system was established uh, almost a century ago, uh, there was not going to be any uh, acceptance of cultural diversity. Uh, the Irish tradition was going to be eliminated from our schools. Um, the Catholic Church was afraid that the Catholic ethos would be eliminated. And, you know, there's historical uh, and, and political and probably educational reasons why that system emerged. Now, we, we, we live in different times now, uh, but there would still be a fear within uh, you know, certainly within the Republican niceness community, I think that uh, that the integrated system is not uh, designed to cater and uh, uh, allow complete cultural and political diversity within its schools. 
that in some sense what it wants to do is provide a neutral environment a, 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 a neutral culture as such so if uh, most of the integrated schools that I'm aware of allow children to wear a poppy uh, in their uniforms around Remembrance Day but there's no integrated school that I'm aware of that would allow a child, for example, to wear an Easter lily to commemorate uh, those who sacrificed their lives for Ireland. Uh, and, and that's just a small point, but it's a sort of acid test for me. If republicanism can't be accommodated within the integrated sector, then all the talk about accommodating cultural diversity uh, doesn't hold water. So I'd, I'd invite you to comment on that. Thanks. And that's my last question here. No, you're, you're, you're well over time and the rest of the members are going to have me for that. However, I don't think anybody is going to be better placed than to give testimony to the cultural and political diversity of integrated education than integrated education alumni. So um, you, I, I'd sacrifice my time for you, Pat. <laughs> go, go ahead, folks. Go ahead. Um, thanks. Thanks, Pat. Um, really good points there. And I think it's something that we really want to spotlight is how integrated education doesn't dim um, your light. It makes it shine even brighter. So that is to say, whatever um, political, cultural, whatever self-identity you have, and I'm speaking from experience here, um, it, you're with others and you don't diminish that. Um, you don't change who you are because of others, but you learn more about others in just a really natural um, way. Um, I'll rem remember um, uh, when I was in sixth year, we were invited um, uh, by Nigel Dodds MP and uh, Ian Paisley Senior to attend um, the European Parliament um, to receive the Flame of Peace. And we went with schools from all across Northern Ireland, sixth forms, uh, pupils from all across Northern Ireland. And it was like, just a brilliant experience. And the experiences that we had, the aspirations that we had were so similar to those other sixth form who were from non-selective, from selective um, schools. And um, that you got a chance to see how other sixth forms were feeling about the world. We were all just about to go off either to university or um, further education in the world of work. Um, and I think the one thing that I did re that did resonate with me was I felt as though, and, and a few of us from here would identify this, that we felt as if we had a better cultural literacy, like a better social awareness, um, that um, we um, had our own beliefs, our own positions, largely, of course, informed by our families, by the wider um, communities that we lived in, but that we understood other people's perspectives. And I think for me, that's the key bit. It doesn't change who you are. It helps you understand more how others feel. Um, so I'll maybe let um, Adam or Michael add to that, but that's my experience. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. We're, almost, Just, we're like, almost out of time, but Adam and Michael, yeah, if you, if you, if you have... Um, uh, One-liners. Yeah, the, the cultural <laughs> and political diversity that, that you guys experienced. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, um, so yeah, conscious of time. So a couple of one-liners. Um, Pat, I, I appreciate the spirit of your question completely. I suppose anecdotally, and this is all anecdotal, uh, the strongest Republican that I know was in my year at uh, at Lagan. And I don't think he necessarily came from like a very strong Republican background. So his his aspiration, if you like, his his view of the world was not dimmed in any, any way by his experience at Lagan. And maybe just another point before I pass to Michael. Um, I don't know whether... Any of you on the committee caught the Patrick Keelty documentary a couple of years ago where he visited Shimna Integrated College, where he spoke to, was astonished to find pupils calmly discussing their different aspirations for Northern Ireland in an integrated setting. So I think that's where we want to get to, right, where everyone has got their own beliefs and ideals about the world, but can discuss them calmly and passionately at the same time. Michael? Thanks, Adam. And the only other point I'll add is that I, I fondly remember a, a phrase that we had in Lagan, which was, if it's important to one of us, then it's important that everyone understands it. It's important to all of us. And I think when it comes to the remarks you made about emblems or significant events, such as um, St. Patrick's Day through to Remembrance Day, through to emblems you referenced, like the poppy and Easter, Easter lily, if, if one student felt strongly about it, it was important that everyone understood the context of it. And that's all about learning.
learn, learning together in one, one environment. Thanks, folks. Okay, I'll move swiftly. Thanks, Pat. Thank move swiftly on to uh, Diane Dodds, MLA, please. Five minutes. Thanks. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, and really nice to talk to you. Um, and I appreciate your stories and your lived experience. It's really, really important. Um, and uh, in many ways, um, you feel you were pioneers. I, I feel in a way that I, I, everybody in the committee is tired of hearing this from me, so they can all close their ears for a moment. Um, but I kind of feel as well, you know, that in many ways, um, I come from a small farming background in County Down. I was very, very fortunate that I grew up in a mixed community. Um, and for me, the early troubles in my early childhood, I had a, I didn't have a lot of money, but I had a, a really lovely childhood in a very mixed community growing up among a lot of people. So I was very lucky um, at that stage in my life. I was very, very lucky. And I, I didn't encounter the segregation um, that other parts of Northern Ireland had. And I still think there are parts of Northern Ireland that have that and, and manage that very, very well. Um, and I suppose I also went um, to a mixed school back in the day. Um, so I, I went to Bambridge Academy, um, which was even then was mixed and now is much, much more mixed. And I, I, I actually, I am very pro children being educated together, but I want to help children in and parents to have the choices that they want to have in terms of education. So for me, I look at the integrated education movement, and that is completely fine. But as I said earlier at the committee. Um, last week I was up at St. Patrick's um, School in Banbridge. Today I'm going to Banbridge High School. Those young people um, are being educated and particularly in sick form together, but they also share more practical classes further on down the school as well. What do you see is the difference between the two? Because I, I genuinely was in the corridors of one school seeing all sorts of uniforms on that particular day. It was really quite, it was really very encouraging and, 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 and really very, very nice to see. Because like you, I want to be, I'm, I'm a unionist. I don't make any, no, no equivocation about it. But I want to respect and tolerate other folk as well. So what, what do you see as the differences? Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Diane. Um, just, I want to clarify your question. Do you mean the difference between like a, a maintained school and a controlled school and an integrated school? Well, a shared, um, I mean, a shared. The, a shared education site. What, and I, do, I know the practical differences. What do you think of the differences in terms of the young people, um, et cetera, et cetera? That, that's the kind of thing I want to hear. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll defer to, others here a bit more of a on the on the policy stuff to this but uh, i just wanted to quickly say that it's great that you didn't experience that segregation diane in, in your schooling experience it'd be great if more people would be able to have that experience there are definitely schools out there that are more mixed but unfortunately that isn't the majority experience and the stats from the department of education seem to bear that out that in controlled schools 7.6 percent of the school population is catholic and in maintained schools 1.2 percent of the school population is protestant so we still have that there are amazing schools out there uh and there were schools that are more mixed but the majority experience is still one of of uh of that division really would anyone like to speak so to can Diane i can i just point? sorry yeah. adam just just to continue the conversation there um so and i'm not disputing your figures i don't have them offhand i'm not disputing them at all um, but that is a parental choice, no? That is a parental choice, I would say. I, I think, and we well, should facilitate parental choice. Should, absolutely. People should have the choice to send their kids to wherever they want to go. Um, I think the question mark here is how many of those parents are getting a true choice to send their children to other schools? Like, Are there places where there is no integrated provision, for example? At the moment, most people do spend, send their kids to controlled schools, maintained schools. There is clearly, in there's consistently polling evidence to show that there's massive demand for integrated education. So it's hard to tell 
if everyone did have that opportunity to send their children to an integrated school as well, whether those statistics would be different. But I, I do want to get to the, the nub of your question, really. So maybe one of my colleagues can talk about some sure. of the differences between integrated and shared education and controlled maintenance. Sure. Uh, just just to make reference to the, the parental choice point as well and the, the, the demand that's evident and to, to reference one of the, the latest statistics, which was from the Good Relations Report, stated that 21% of children who had put integrated education as their first preference were unable to get a place. Again, continual polling shows that well over, now over 70% of, of, of those in Northern Ireland believe that it should be, should be the norm. I also think we, we need to make a, a keen differentiation here between an inclusive school, and Diane, as you referenced, there are many really good inclusive schools in Northern Ireland, but there's a, a distinct difference between you na naturally becoming inclusive and then integrated, because integrated is, is planned for, it's, it's done with, with purpose and intention, from the moment that you walk through the door of an integrated school, the curriculum is like made reference to the way that the sporting facilities are laid out. It's done with this concept of making sure that individuals, young people come together in that one environment. Um, and as my, my colleague made reference to, the outputs of that, you know, again, are, are showing in evidence. Um, in regards to just your point around shared education, and I agree, I think it's, it's great now, considering where we were in the 80s and 90s, to see that schools like Our Ladies of St. Patrick's College Knock and Grosvenor and the likes of Lagan are working together, because um, we wouldn't have seen that a, a long time ago. Um, I think there are some merits in shared education, though, however, this is not really the remit of, of, of the bill. And I think we need to be careful whenever, you know, if, if we're promoting shared education, that you know, we don't just amplify close proximity segregation, where you're walking through the corridors, students wearing different uniforms and you're there sidelining. There are key differentiations between us. I think we need to position our education system in a realm where we're, we're again showcasing that there's much more that brings us together than divides us. Okay, Diane, that's almost seven minutes if you want a, a final remark there. No, no. Well, I could continue this this conversation for quite a while because this is what, this is something I genuinely interested in. You, you, you could. Um, I definitely we'll can't allow you to <laughs> in this context. Yes. <laughs> We're happy to speak uh, outside of this setting thanks, as well, Diane. Thanks, if you wanted to continue that thanks, conversation, we'd be very happy to do it. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Justin McNulty, MLA, please. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, folks. A uh, really interesting conversation, really thought-provoking conversation, folks. So thank you all very much for your for your evidence today. Um, Lise, you, you, you discussed your living, breathing conflict resolution at your school. I went to the Abbey in Yerry, and uh, the same school as a man called Seamus Mallon went to. He was living, breathing conflict resolution. He stepped up to the market. He delivered on that conflict resolution. So, uh, and I feel felt strongly when when all of you were just describing your educational experiences. Um, I was thinking that's just my school. Except we didn't have a Remembrance Day ceremony. We didn't have maybe wearing uh, Easter lilies either. Um, and there was, you know, reaching out to the other side, reaching out to all, people from different faiths and all. Um, and you know, we had different faiths and all in our school as well. It's a guy, it's a guy called. Lawrence Wong from Malaysia, I sat beside Davy Lowe in maths from Hong Kong, you know, so I had that experience in my school. So it's very important to recognize that not only integrated educated schools and, you know, have those experiences, those, those very positive experiences. Um, and, to, and also in terms of your, your proposition, Adam, that every child should have the opportunity to attend an, an integrated school, or sorry, Michael said that, should every child have the opportunity to attend an Irish medium secular school? We, we make, and thanks Justin for your, your sentiments, and I think the sentiments you make about Seamus Mallard are, are very well made. Um, and we come back to that kind of key point where this is this bill is, is around choice, and, and we believe the fundamentals of this bill allow for parents to make that choice. I come back to the fact that over 20% of first applications to integrated schools and, and for students to attend, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, were refused. There is overwhelming demand for integrated education, but that choice isn't there for parents and young people to attend those schools. Equally, again, 
the, the fundamentals of this bill, and I know there was a little bit of, of contention around any new school that's set up should be integrated, but what, what we have to remember here is that this, the status quo of controlled maintained schools, that, that's, that's what really exists in the landscape of education at the minute. We need to bring integrated education to become on a, an equal playing field. As and when parents wish to send their child to controlled maintained Irish medium, Parental choice is key, and absolutely, that choice should, should be prevalent and should be there. It's just unfortunate that integrated education isn't currently on the same playing field. Very good. Uh, um, in there. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, Liz. Yeah, no, just, just saying, you know, I've got um, kind of really exciting examples of um, integrated provision also with an Irish medium. So we've had, um, you know, a new nursery provision um, in that area. And I think that's something that helps you see the kind of evolution, the growth, um, how, um, yeah, all um, parental choice should be accommodated. And that's a really interesting, exciting way, I think, of, of that moving forward. It's fell fast leading the way, Liz. Thank you. Um, we, we, we all portrayed a very positive picture, guys, and you know that's important. Um, and we all we all are broadly supportive. We you know we all support integrated education as a concept in the north, and we think it's vitally important. We're all behind this. But but where, as you see it, are the challenges with the bill? As as as, are, as others have alluded to, you know, we are legislators, and our job is to scrutinise legislation. And um, otherwise, we'd be failing in terms of our roles. What what? Where are the challenges, where are the problems as you see it within the bill as it stands? I know the committee had expressed some concerns about presumptions um, of future schools, but I suppose when we're looking at the huge gap between supply and demand, um, for us it's a, a very positive action to take um, to support parental choice. Um, so uh, although I think the committee have highlighted that for, for us, a presumption um, doesn't mean um, it must, but it's a presumption then to, um, I think, allow um, wider parental choice because we know there is there's demand for that out there. Yeah, maybe just to jump in as well, um, turn the question on its head a little bit. Um, Justin, the thing that really excites me about the bill is the idea of the department being obligated to promote integrated education. It does really seem, I think Michael alluded to this as well, that since 1989 we haven't seen the department really step up to even facilitate or encourage integrated education. Um, it seems staggering that all those schools were founded by brave parents who basically had to take a risk with their kids' education if they wanted integrated education. I would like to see a situation where if there is parental choice in an area, it isn't just left to parents to just sort it out themselves, that the department would proactively encourage it. I think it's really concerning, uh, just reviewing the IEF's um, session, that the IEF and the department seem to be so at odds on this. You could imagine that the Department of Education should be in a position where they've got a really good relationship with other stakeholders, and it doesn't really seem to be the case. You know, the IEF seem to believe um, in their experience that the department really doesn't, it isn't stepping up to that duty to facilitate and promote integrated education. And they've even had to go to the courts to sort it out. So I think that's a really concerning situation that that bill would try and address. The other challenge, slightly different challenge is if this bill isn't passed, then what are the parties, what is the plan of the parties in the committee to actually facilitate and encourage integrated education? Um, I mean, maybe that's more of a question to you, and of course, you're supposed to be questioning me. But that is one of the things that I would I would really consider. What is the alternative plan to promote integrated education? Okay. Um, well, your job is not to question us. Our job is to question you. Um, in terms of the integrated educated funds and the disparity between what their positions are and what the, the department's positions are, you know, the department did make you know did table many, many grievances with the bill. Now, the, the department need to answer the questions on that, not me. Um, in terms of your piece around promotion um, by the departments, is it the department's role to promote all sectors of education equally, or what's, what's your perspective on that and how that fits into the bill? So maybe, sorry, I know I'm talking a lot, but I will stop in a second. Uh, I guess I'm I would... going to have to stop all of you on, on Justin in a second. Go ahead okay. there, Adam. Thanks. Incredibly quick response then. Um, 
given that the the parties in the assembly and the executive have signed so many agreements over the years fresh start good friday etc cetera, etc cetera, where they've said that integrated education is part of conflict resolution is part of the future i believe the department should have a duty to promote integrated education okay thanks sorry justin we're out of time there um thanks for those questions um Maybe just need to. I, I do my best to be impartial as chair, but just to make sure there is some recognition that um, the commit some of the committee concerns are not necessarily my concerns, given uh, it is an Alliance Party colleague that is promoting the bill. Um, I think I think that was a super question, by the way, Adam, in terms of what the what what everyone else's plans are to encourage integrated education. My I meant to raise it earlier as well, but we've. We've, we've made a lot of um, stating that to promote integrated education would elevate integrated education. Um, the Good Friday Belfast Agreement isolates um, the encouragement and facilitation of integrated education and Irish medium. I don't think we refer to that as having elevated integrated education and most of us on this committee signed up to that agreement. So an interesting thought. Um, can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA, please? Thanks. Sorry, I was on mute there. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, everyone. Really, really interesting uh, presentation. It's really good to hear from you, actually. And just on that there um, point about parental choice and that, like, I fully think that integrated education should have the right resources um in order to like in line with statutory duty to support the demand and the need that's there um so that the sector can grow but in regards to choice and in regards to this bill specifically um the, the bill intends as we just talked about there intends to apply presumption that all new schools will be integrated so that will you know if that was to come into effect um you know, what would pose problems for the wider kind of education system, the fact that it was going it would be prioritized over other sectors. So I think there is um concern there, I suppose, around that. Um I know in previous briefings we've had we talked about the special circumstances in that and um talked about what kind of a new school is going to be defined by. And I know that Kelly Armstrong is the sponsor of the bill had um she her kind of what she kind of said was that, you know, a new school, there haven't been that many built, but we have to be very careful around that there because, um, like, this has actually been put into legislation, so we can't kind of work off the the notion that, oh, there aren't that many new schools built anyway, so they won't all be integrated schools, you know. So um, I kind of like your, view, your views on that there point, please. Thanks. Thanks, Nicola. And, and yes, you make, you make very good points in that respect. And you are right to reference that in the last five years, only one new school has been founded, but equally to be careful as legislators within your role to make sure all ground is covered. Well, what I would just want, want to highlight is that the presumption is there, but that doesn't necessarily immediately mean that no new schools can be founded um, that aren't integrated. Um, new schools can absolutely be founded that are controlled, maintained, and particularly Irish medium, as, the, as Chris alludes to the provision that was set out in the Good Friday Belfast Agreements. If substantial evidence is provided in the, in the establishment of a new school, um, then that new school can easily go ahead and, and establish. As long as there is a, a substantial evidence, be it from, from parents or from other wider stakeholders within wherever that school is being founded, to suggest that that is the need and demand of those that are going to be involved. Um, the presumption is there because there is overwhelming evidence that integrated education is the is the preferred choice of most in Northern Ireland. But if evidence is there to suggest otherwise, then the bill still has the provision in play to allow that to happen. Um, so my understanding of it is, Michael, that um, it all new schools would be presumed to be an integrated school unless um, there were special circumstances which haven't been defined yet. So um, it, it, uh, it would actually be that all new schools would be integrated. So uh, that's my point. We need to be careful with the language we use within the legislation because that means they would get priority. Um, so I'm just I'm just pointing that out, you know, um, that, uh, that we do need to be careful with it. The other kind of point I wanted to ask is about was the um, independent review into education. And we know a panel was set up there recently and um, they'll be doing their work on it. 
I wonder, just in your opinion, do you think this is preempting the like this is bill preempting the um, findings of the review panel? Um, and should we maybe be waiting until we get the results from the panel before we introduce such a kind of substantial bill? Thanks, Nicola. Um, really good point on um, the independent review coming up. I'll maybe just take this and then if anyone else wants to jump in. Um, I think given the time skills that we're talking about um, of um, undertaking the, the independent review, then the actions from the independent review, I think we're talking about a much longer period. Um, and so the bill I think is needed now. Uh, we've talked about supply and demand, but we've talked about parental choice. I think at the minute now, uh, in as a adult and now with friends um, in Belfast looking for um, schools to send their children to who would like to go to integrated schools, I'm seeing firsthand the anguish of that, as Michael kind of referenced, 21% of first entries into integrated schools aren't, um, you know, aren't getting their places. You know, parents are, are really... Um, upset, they feel a wee bit disenfranchised that they aren't getting that. So I think any delay to um, the to the bill um, uh, or pausing the bill ahead of the independent review, I think just stops that work. And I think what we're saying is people want to see change now. You know, the people in, who would like that choice for their children, you know, are voters, their constituents, or citizens. They, they want to see that change. So I think it's on all of us to provide the choice. And that's what we're talking about, the choice, if they would like to. And at the minute, a lot of parents don't have that choice. And um, it's it's a challenging period for them. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Lisa. Listen, I agree. Like I said at the start there, I do think the provisions need to be there so that people who do want to send their children to or children who want to go to integrated um, schools should have that option, absolutely, and we, we should be working towards that. I, I fully agree with that. Um, listen, thanks so much to the three of you. Really, really interesting to hear from you and hear about your experience of going to integrated education. And listen, this conversation will continue for a while, but um, it's really good to hear from you. Thank you, and thanks, Chair. Thanks, Nicola, and thank thank you to all our, our witnesses for your submission and your your oral briefing to us today. Um, found that a really helpful conversation. Um, we'll be glad to keep in touch with you throughout the the progression of the bill. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and to add members to the spotlight and ask the clerk to summarise any actions resulting from the briefing. Thank you. So in terms of actions, Chair, um, I think um, some of the, the same um, themes are beginning to emerge in, in these discussions. Um, and uh, so I will collate those for the for the members and also reflect them to the sponsor. Um, the Clause 7 um, presumption that new schools will be integrated um, is, is one area that there's been an awful lot of discussion around. Um, the witnesses mentioned um, the idea of positive action, and I don't know that that's been uh, re that the, the issue has been framed in that way uh, to date. Um, and so we'll maybe look at that when the research comes to the committee um, on the 11th of November. Um, and yeah, I don't want to hold back from the next session, actually, because I know yeah, really no, time, but, no problem. Um, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks for that, Clark. Um, I move us on then to our our final uh, witnesses for today, the oral briefing from the Northern Ireland Humanists on the Integrated Education Bill. Can I ask the Assembly Broadcasting to remove members and to add our witnesses and refer members to the Northern Ireland Humanists' response to the committee call for evidence on the Integrated Education Bill at page 45. Can I give a, a warm welcome to Boyd Slater, Coordinator of Northern Ireland Humanists, and Dr. Ruth Wareham, Education Campaigns Manager for Humanists UK. You're very welcome, folks, and you'll have up to uh, 10 minutes if you need it to make an opening statement before questions from witnesses. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we're very welcome. Uh, we welcome this opportunity to give oral evidence to the Committee on the Integrated Education Bill. Northern Ireland Humanists is part of Humanists UK, the national charity working on behalf of non-religious people. We advance free thinking and promote humanism to create a tolerant society where rational thinking and, can, and kindness prevail. Northern Ireland Humanists is the fastest growing section of Humanists UK. We provide weddings, funerals, baby naming ceremonies and won the right for humanist weddings to be legally recognised in Northern Ireland in 2018. We also offer non-religious pastoral care in McGabry Prison and one of our volunteers recently became the first non-religious chaplain of a sports club in the UK. We participate in a range of dialogue activities with other religion and belief groups and are members of the Interfaith Forum of Northern Ireland. With respect to education, we train and provide accredited school speakers, as well as training teachers and resources. These include our Understanding Humanism website and Assemblies for All, our Inclusive Assemblies resource hub. Our education and support services benefit over a million people every year. We have a long history of work in education, children's rights and equality with expertise in the religion or belief strand. We've been involved in policy development around schools and the curriculum for over 60 years and have made detailed responses to all recent reviews of the curriculum in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. We regularly submit memoranda of evidence to MPs, MLAs, civil servants and parliamentary select committees on a range of education issues. We're an active member of many organisations working in education in the UK, including the Religious Education Education Council for England and Wales, of which we're a founding member, the Sex Education Forum, the PSHE Association, Rights of the Child UK and the Children's Rights Alliance for England. Northern Ireland Humanists advocates for schools that educate children from different religious and belief backgrounds together and has long campaigned for a single system of education in Northern Ireland. On this basis, we support the forthcoming independent review of education scheduled to begin this year. In addition to our work on desegregating the education system, we advocate for a fully inclusive curriculum that is objective, critical and pluralistic, particularly with respect to religions and humanism. We do so because we support freedom of religion and belief, including for children. We firmly support the bill's overarching intention to further expand integrated education and to introduce a presumption that all new schools should have integrated status. At present, most children from Catholic and Protestant backgrounds are educated apart from one another. For example, recent government data shows that less than 1% of pupils classified as Protestant attend Catholic maintained primary schools and just 8% of pupils in controlled primaries are classified as Catholic. By contrast, and as this committee will be well aware, integrated schools work hard to balance the proportion of pupils from each community they serve. They aim at having 40% of pupils from Catholic backgrounds, 40% from Protestant backgrounds, and 20 from other backgrounds, including the non-religious and minority faiths. However, according to school enrolment data published this year, at present, 29% of pupils attending integrated schools are actually from backgrounds other than Protestant and Catholic, and that number rises to 34% at primary level. Integrated education seeks to address the harms caused by segregation, and there's a wealth of robust evidence to suggest that positive contact of the kind that happens in schools with diverse intakes is pivotal to community cohesion. For instance, research conducted by Professor Miles Houston and a team from the University of Oxford found that pupils in mixed schools are more trusting and have more positive views of children from different backgrounds than do pupils in segregated schools. Elsewhere, the authors of the same study argue that Segregation deprives young people of the opportunity to mix across ethnic and religious lines in a way that thwarts positive attitudes to members of so-called outgroups. As the committee have heard in other evidence sessions, and perhaps because of the positive contribution they make to social cohesion, integrated schools are popular among parents. A 2018 poll showed that 67% of parents would support their child's school becoming integrated. An attitudinal poll conducted this year found 71% of the wider population think integrated education should be the norm. And previous research also suggests that 91% think these schools are important for promoting a shared and better future. Future. But just 7% of Northern Ireland schools have integrated status, meaning this option is simply not available to large numbers of parents, with a recent report by Ulster University's UNESCO Centre concluding that the choice of integrated education is illusory for many families. By comparison, the mixed community ethos sector in other UK countries is far higher, 76% in England, 85% in Wales and 86% in Scotland. 
Even in Ireland, where 95% of schools are denominational, the government has made a commitment to divestment and to expand the number of Educate Together schools. So, the evidence shows that the expansion of the integrated sector outlined by this bill is a necessary and desirable solution to problems of integration, social cohesion and inclusivity for Northern Ireland. However, we are concerned that it is nowhere near sufficient. This is because it does nothing to address the, to the extent to which the current system is biased towards Christianity and therefore fails to adequately, adequately include or respect the freedom of religion or belief of children and parents who are non-religious or identity with minority faiths. The bill says that an integrated school is a school which intentionally promotes, protects and improves an ethos of, of diversity, respect and understanding between those of different cultures and religious beliefs or of none on, and of none. But to achieve that purpose, the bill must further require the integrated school to promote the principles of equality, non-discrimination and freedom of religion and belief laid out in the European Convention of Human Rights and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. One reason the current bill fails to do this stems from the way integrated schools currently teach about religion. At present, the law requires every grant-aided school to provide religious education and daily collective worship. In controlled schools, some of which have integrated status, RE is expected to be based on the Christian holy scriptures, although it's not permitted to be distinctive of any particular religious denomination. In addition, the core RE syllabus, which was published in 2007 and is used by integrated schools, has been put together by the four largest denominational churches in Northern Ireland and is almost exclusively Christian, save for one unit on world religions at Key Stage 3. Non-religious worldviews such as humanism are not covered at all. Unlike in England and Wales, there's no legal requirement for collective worship in Northern Ireland to be Christian, but because of the faith informed nature of the system, this is invariably how it's delivered, including in the context of integrated schools, which retain an exclusively Christian ethos. And of course, any form of worship can never be inclusive of pupils of different religions and of non-religious backgrounds. Parents do have the right to withdraw their children from worship and RE, but this can be difficult and isolating for the child. What's more, a meaningful educational alternative is rarely provided. This means parents have to choose between subjecting their children to religious indoctrination by participating in worship and RE that doesn't reflect their deeply, deeply held beliefs, or letting them be alienated from their peers with nothing educational worth to do. And unlike the rest of the UK, older pupils are unable to withdraw themselves from worship. In its last report on Great Britain and Northern Ireland, known as the Concluding Observations, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child recommended that worship laws should be repealed and ch children should be permitted to independently exercise the right to withdraw from religious worship at school. But to date, no action has been taken on this matter. With all this in mind, the important aims of the bill threaten to be seriously undermined if they are not accompanied by provisions that ensure an integrated schools have a fully inclusive ethos. Without this, efforts to diversify pupil intake can never be fully inclusive because children from non-Christian backgrounds are being sent a clear message that their own beliefs are not as highly valued as those of Christianity. The exclusion of non-religious and minority faith viewpoints also pulls against the Toledo guiding principles on teaching about religion and belief. The principles explicitly state that this should be sensitive to different local manifestations of religious and secular plurality, found in schools and the community they serve. Because of their underlying aims, integrated schools in particular must be allowed to operate without the discriminatory burden of collective worship and Christian RE. They should instead introduce inclusive assemblies and pluralistic RE that teach about religions and humanism in an objective way to fully support a fair and equal ethos in their schools. We regularly work with non-religious families who feel ostracised and excluded by the education system in Northern Ireland and through our work with minority faith groups are aware that this is a problem for them too. Here it's also worth noting that the law pertaining to Christian RE and worship in Northern Ireland is about to come before the High Court after a non-religious parent and child won permission to judicially review the Christian-centric nature of the law on the grounds that it violates their human right to freedom of religion or belief. This landmark case follows a similar High Court case in England. 
In that case, which took place in 2015, humanist parents successfully challenged government guidance, saying a GCSE religious studies syllabus that did not include the systematic study of a non-religious worldview could satisfy the statutory requirement for RE at Key Stage 4. The court found a curriculum that did not cover non-religious perspectives would not meet the legal standard of being objective, critical and pluralistic. This is because it would not afford such perspectives equal respect to religions. All this matters because the number of non-Christians in Northern Ireland is rising rapidly. The most recent Life and Time survey found that 27% of people in Northern Ireland now regard themselves as belonging to no religion. Amongst people aged 18 to 24, this is even higher, with 36% identifying as non-religious compared to 30% Protestant and 34% Catholic. On the basis of this demographic data alone, the continued privilege afforded to Christianity in Northern Ireland's education system is hard to justify. In the context of a bill designed to help integrate people from different communities, it's entirely indefensible. To achieve the purpose of integrated schools that fully respect the freedom of religion or belief of children and their families, the bill must tackle the Christian bias that's inherent in the system and provide for integrated schools to have an open, inclusive ethos. Thank you for listening. We welcome your questions. Thanks very much indeed for uh, those opening remarks. Uh, can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA, please? Sorry, I'm struggling to get off mute. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Boyd and Ruth. There was a lot of information in that there, so I will need to ask some questions. Um, so I think we're both in agreement from the outset that we agree with um, the concept of integrated education and we want to see your children integrated. but. Can you? I know. I, I'm sorry to make you repeat yourselves, but can you briefly just outline your issues with the bill that's before us? Or were your yeah, so, yeah. So our primary concern is that although the bill widens the definition of inclusive um, uh, integrated education so that it includes the non-religious and people of minority faiths whereas it just used to previously refer to Protestants and Catholics. So it, it's very positive in, in that respect, but it doesn't remove the fact that these schools have a Christian ethos. And so they can never be fully inclusive or really fully integrated because they're supposed to be predicated on this attitude of mutual respect. But if what you're teaching in religious education is primarily Christian religious education, with a, an occasional module on world religions which comes at secondary level and nothing at all on non-religious worldviews and if you're insisting that there's a daily act of worship which will in almost all cases be a christian act of worship and obviously not then appropriate to non-religious people or indeed people from minority faiths then what you've got in front of you isn't fully inclusive education and we think that to be fully integrated, to achieve its aims, the bill needs to make sure that that's the kind of ethos that integrated schools have. Okay, no, I get you now, Ruth, that's fine, thank you. Um, in regards then to the bill, um, I suppose what we were kind of focusing on was also the side of it being um, the, the duty to promote integrated education above um, other sectors um, within the education system. Now, it's slightly different to what you're talking about there, but what are your views there um, um, with that there? With, do you think it's fair that uh, the integrated sector should be elevated um, above other sectors, despite your other concerns around the bill? Yes, we fully agree with the idea that there should be a duty to promote integrated education and that there should be a presumption that new schools are integrated. We don't see this necessarily as elevating that particular sector. Um, what it's worth understanding is that, you know, the present situation is that we have all schools in Northern Ireland with, with a Christian ethos. And we need to move to a situation where we have more mixed schools that are less segregated and have this inclusive ethos that we're talking about. And 
in the presentation, we contrasted the number of schools, the proportion of schools in Northern Ireland that have that sort of ethos compared to other countries, say, in the UK. So 76 percent of schools in England, 85 percent in Wales, 86 in Scotland are mixed community ethos schools. Um, and it's really important to remember that it's actually possible to elevate these kinds of schools above other kinds of schools because under Article 2 of the first protocol of the European Convention on Human Rights, it guarantees the right to education, but parents don't have an absolute right to a school that completely reproduces and satisfies their educational preferences in all respects. So, for example, faith schools. Now, of course, Northern Ireland has decided that it provides faith schools. But what parents have is a right to have their religious and philosophical convictions respected by the provision of education. So it doesn't seek to impose that particular worldview. And that's an education that's objective, critical and pluralistic. So it's not seeking to impose a particular faith, for example. So the state's entitled to promote an education system that does that in law. Um, and so they're also allowed to balance that out against the broader needs of, of the wider population. So we're in a situation where most of the schools in Northern Ireland are segregated and it would be better. All of the academic evidence shows it would be better if children were educated in mixed schools. So because of the needs of the wider society as well, we need to to take that into account when we're making decisions about which schools to prioritise. Now, of course, prioritising doesn't mean that no other school can open. And I think the bill makes clear that there are special circumstances in which other schools might open. But I think that the decision to prioritise integrated schools, given that the integrated schools movement is now 40 years old and we're only at 7% of schools, being integrated, something needs to be done to actively manage that and push things forward, particularly in light of the number of people who want these schools. All right, Ray, thank you for that. I would have concerns about the, the still I would have concerns about the word promote there though, um, especially in regards to the lack of the Irish medium sector. And I do think that that do, well, it would elevate um, the integrated sector over the likes of the Irish medium sector. So that that's kind of where my concerns lie there. And I suppose with um, clause seven and um, that presumption of all new schools being integrated, um, just by, except for those special circumstances. Again, there's just not enough clarity around that there um, at the moment, I don't think. Um, but I suppose that that's just something we need to tease out as we go through this process throughout the committee. Yeah. Um, what, is there anything you want to say there? Yeah, no, I was, I was just going to agree with you, Nicola, there, because, I mean, obviously, Pat had also said earlier about, you know, making sure that there is clear legislation, and that is one of the things that we're we're asking for, making sure there's clarity, because it is a bit fluffy around the edges at the minute with it. Yeah, and listen, that, it's, uh, that's why it's so good to hear from you and hear your perspective on this because it, it would impact so many. So nobody wants to rush in with this type of legislation, which is so um, kind of vast and with such a huge effect on the whole education system without taking in everyone's views and understanding the wider kind of implications of it. Um, so I think that that's why these meetings are so important or crucial, really, and why we need to continue having these discussions. I chair for that. Thanks, Nicola. Justin McNulty, MLA, please. One second, Chair. No problem. Folks, sorry I'm doubling up on the previous questions, but what, what was the what were the challenges? you see as are with the current legislation as it's um as it as is boy did you want to kick us off with that one um well the current legislation as is um with regards to to our schools in northern ireland is is still promoting this uh, segregation you know as has come up in the data that that, that, that has been sort of provided sorry here forgive me forgive me sorry to cut across you boy uh, i'm talking about the, the bill as is Oh, the objections with the bill as is, and um, with, with the bill as is, uh, again, our objection is that there's it's not there's not it's not clear enough in terms of clarifying the the, the how 
an integrated sector would be would be set up and what, what and what the ethos of the integrated sector is for us there is this this huge concern over ethos because at the minute there actually isn't any alternative for non-religious parents or those parents of minority faith beliefs in Northern Ireland, because every school in Northern Ireland is of is a is of a Christian ethos. Um, uh, so, so there there are huge challenges there in terms of clarifying that, and making sure that the integrated sector is truly integrated in Northern Ireland. It's not uh, it's not integrated Catholic and Protestant schools. These need to be schools for everyone, where everybody is respected and where those beliefs are respected. And the curriculum also has to um, reflect that as well. Yeah, can I just add, it's, it's just to say that in the previous evidence sessions, we've heard people talking about how there's nothing in this bill that removes the Christian ethos or the Christian basis of all schools in Northern Ireland. And for us, that's that's very problematic to be able to say that all of the schools in Northern Ireland have a particular religious ethos when not all of the people in Northern Ireland have that particular religious belief is really, really problematic. If you are pushing a particular faith as the, the primary one uh, within the context of schools, then that threatens the freedom of religion or belief of all the children and their families who don't share that particular view. And it, it seems bizarre that we're in a situation in the 21st century whereby there are no opportunities for people who do not want a religiously informed education to choose a school where that is possible, particularly given that human rights law, the schools that they guarantee are ones that are critical, objective and pluralistic in this way, this freedom from religious indoctrination. So it's hugely problematic and we would want to see in a bill that it intends to promote mutual understanding between different groups, this change happening. Ruth, strong words, religious indoctrination. I wouldn't describe my education have, uh, as having indoctrinated me with any religion or, or none. Um, so so that, that's a strong terminology to use, Ruth, you must recognise. Tell me, what, what is the, uh, what, what's, what's the humanist skin in the game here? So just to pick up on the terminology indoctrination, that's actually the legal term indoctrination. I know indoctrination gets used as a pejorative term for people teaching things that I don't like. And lots of people might throw that around as a pejorative term. But in the uh, legal uh, cases and in the legal language, indoctrination just is when you impose or prioritise a particular worldview, wouldn't necessarily have to be a religious worldview. If you opened a school and imposed humanism on everybody, that would count as well. It, it's basically a legal term that points out that the state doesn't have a right to impose a particular perspective on children and their families. So it, it's not pejorative in the way it gets used colloquially. So I'd like to make sure that that's, that's clear. In terms of what our skin in the game is, we work with hundreds of non-religious parents every year who are struggling within the Northern Irish school system. So they can't choose a school that doesn't um, promote Christianity or have um, Christian worship. Now they can withdraw from those sessions, but nothing of meaningful educational worth is offered as, as an alternative. So they spend a lot of time sitting in hallways and waiting for their peers to return. It's isolating, it singles them out as, as different. And there should be an option for the non-religious and people of minority faiths and indeed Christians who perhaps just think that children and young people ought to be able to make up their own minds about these things to have schools where their views are respected in the sense that you're not trying to teach a particular um, perspective as true. I think that that's the issue for us and it is a problem that, that we are encountering more and more as more and more people in Northern Ireland identify as non-religious and get in touch with us. Yeah, um, well, I would I would refrain from using the word indoctrinated, whether it's a legal uh, 
piece or otherwise. I just I think it would it just serves to get people's backs up because I went through a Catholic ethos, ethos education, but I certainly wasn't indoctrinated. And um, whether whether that's government position or legal position or any other position, I wasn't indoctrinated. And um, but listen, I, I hear your perspectives, very interesting views, and uh, you've made your cases very strongly. So thank you very much for your evidence today, folks. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. And thank, thanks very much indeed, Boyd and Henry, for the, the presentations today. Um, obviously, the bill stage will complete on the uh, 24th of November, I think it is, we report back. So if you have any um, specific amendment suggestions, um, you know, in addition to the evidence that's presented today, obviously, feel free to make those known to the, the committee. Um, and, and there's a, a wide range of additional um, uh, uh, additional issues there that may or may not be covered by the bill that we'd be glad to um, engage with you on a, on, a, on a future basis. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and to add members back into the spotlight and just to ask the clerk to summarise any further actions necessary uh, before the close of the committee meeting today. Chair, um, so again, just a, um, you know, a need for us to to flesh out um, these uh, issues that that are coming up um, repeatedly, um, promotion and what that means, and um, you know how the integrated sector wants to be promoted, and whether that is over and above any of the other sectors, or whether they're currently on a par, you know, say with Irish Medium, um. You know, and what what promotion should look like. I think that um is something that members want to see fleshed out a bit more, and and witnesses as well. Um, don't all seem to be entirely um sure of you know how much that uh, the extent to which that should be done. Um, the um these witnesses said that the bill was slightly fl fluffy around the edges. Um, but certainly they they made a case for um. A need for more clarity um, on ethos and from their perspective that's particularly from a non-religious um, point of view so um, the fact that all schools in Northern Ireland have a Christian ethos is something that they're highlighting um, um, and that's the, that's the first time that that has been raised um, so yeah again uh, presumption, the presumption that all future schools should be integrated uh, you know, promotion and what promotion should entail. Um, and now this question of ethos, um, those are, those have been recurring. Um, in previous sessions, the ethos uh, issue was raised in terms of, you know, will the, will the Christian um, balance be retained? You know, these reasonable numbers of Catholics and Protestants and others, you know, is that still in place? Um, so there's been some discussion and some clarification of that along the way. Um, and as I said to members earlier, um, the bill folder um, with the uh, paperwork to date um, ha issued yesterday. So members should have that now to, to be able to read through submissions um, in full. Um, and I'll add in the correspondence that I, um, that I write about these themes um, as, I, as I send them to the, to the sponsor as well. That's great, Clark. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything additional, Chair, that I've um, that you want to add? Or? No, I think, I think that's a comprehensive summary. Content with that, Nicola, yeah? Yeah, I'm happy with that, yeah. Chris. Leaving. Okay. Um, okay, then, uh, agenda item nine is any other business. I don't think we have any other business, Clark. No? No, Chair. No. Okay, then that is us for today and the date and time of the next meeting is Wednesday the 3rd of November at 9.15am. The meeting does now adjourn. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.